our VLC. We offer value, providing you with quality review programs and online seminars that bring out the best in you. At VLC, we listen. Adapting to the times, we brought our in-demand on-ground review lectures online with our virtual law companion. Subscribing to this online learning platform means you get 24-7 access to our updated video lectures and bar review notes from the best and most respected lecturers and professors. At VLC, we collaborate, working with the best technology providers through our learning management system to best prepare you for the first ever digitalized bar exams. We work hand in hand with legal experts you can trust, providing top-notch services to those who need it the most through our free online legal consultations and free lecture series. Value, listen, and collaborate. This is the VLC way. And we are VLC.
Only a just me, Yeshua says, Warren to Warren to Christ. Nobody else. That is very important. And before a just me, Yeshua says, Warren to Warren to Christ. What are the requirements? First, there may be trouble cause. Number two, to be determined personally by the judge. Number three, after examination under oath of the complainant and the witnesses may produce. Number four, particularly describing the search, place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized or arrested. Those are the requisites before a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest. But first of all, take note, only a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest, nobody else. That's why uh, it's still pending on the Supreme Court now, diba? Right? Article 3, paragraph 3 of the family code, we have the provision for a marriage ceremony. Now, in our jurisdiction, we do not recognize unceremonial marriages. There must be a marriage ceremony. The minimum requirement is that the contracting parties must personally appear before the solemnizing officer and personally declare that they take each other as husband and wife in the presence of at least two witnesses of legal age. Now, even assuming that there was no uh, witness here, the marriage will also remain valid. That will be considered a mere irregularity that will not affect the validity of the marriage. Now, under Article 26, Paragraph 1 of the Family Code, all marriages solidize... within the contemplation of Article 4 of the Revised Penal Code as a general rule, threat to spouse, that is threat, that is a felony. Tinakot mo sasaktan eh, papaluin eh. Pero in this case, the threat to spouse is a justified threat to spouse due to the circumstance of no, de uh, defense of property. And second, the threat to spank was made in the exercise of a right under the self-help doctrine, Article 429 of the Revised Penal Code. Owner, owner or lawful possessor of a thing has the right to exclude others from the enjoyment or disposal thereof. And for this purpose, they may use force which is reasonably necessary to pre prevent or repel an act. Issuance of a warrant of arrest is to follow blindly the finding of probable cause by the prosecutor, precisely because the prosecutor determines probable cause for the filing of the information in court, whereas the judge determines probable cause for the issuance of warrant of arrest. So, okay, well. Pero sa issuance ng search warrant, as mentioned, it should be proving. In other words, my friends, the judge must personally conduct an examination of the complainant and the witnesses um, that he may produce under oath or affirmation. The examination by the judge must be proven. Okay? It is not enough to merely adopt the questions and answers asked by the, by a, by the previous uh, investigator, during the PI. Magkaiba yun. Bakit? Kailangan po, the judge should personally examine the complainant and the witnesses. So this are the...
Good day to our dear attendees from different parts of the country. I pray that you're all in a great state of health. This free webinar is streaming live via the Villalis Law Center's YouTube channel and Facebook page. If you can hear my voice clearly, please type in the comment section hashtag VLC. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Optimize this learning opportunity. Share this free online lecture to your friends and together learn at the comfort of your homes. I want to formally welcome you all to this free webinar. This is part of a series of free online lectures brought to you by the virtual law companion of Villages Law Center. Allow me to share to you this good news. The Virtual Law Companion is the newest innovation of Villages Law Center, which aims to provide an easy, convenient, and quality bar review experience. The Virtual Law Companion is a web application that is hosted on a dedicated cloud server. It can be accessed via the internet 24-7 for any web browser using any device or handheld computers like Android or iOS phones. Meaning, you can study anytime, anywhere, and from any mobile device. Please visit our website at www.biliasislawcenter.com to know more about our programs and activities. Before we formally start, please take note of some reminders. First, this free webinar is pre-recorded to ensure the uninterrupted streaming of lectures. Secondly, VLC team will be with you to assist you should you need more information about our program. Please visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Without further ado, please give your virtual class and welcome our lecturer today. Again, this free webinar is brought to you by our virtual law companion. Maraming salamat po. Together, we can make things happen. Together, we can. Our lecturer is an authority in criminal law and special penal laws. He has obtained his Juris Doctor and Master of Laws degrees from San Sebastian College Recoletos, Manila. He teaches criminal law and special penal laws at San Sebastian College Recoletos, Adamson University, New Era University, and Thomas Claudio Memorial College. He is a seasoned bar reviewer and MCLE lecturer. He has authored books entitled Criminal Law Concepts and Jurisprudence, Book 1 and Book 2 of the Revised Penal Code, 2020 edition, Special Penal Laws Concepts and Jurisprudence, 2019 edition, Concepts and Jurisprudence on Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act of 2002, 2020 edition, and Compendium of Special Penal Laws, 2019 edition, all published by the Central Book Supply Incorporated. Currently, he serves as an assistant city prosecutor in Antipolo City. Let us all welcome Professor Freddy M. Noyara. Good day, everyone. I am Professor Freddy Nohara, and welcome to this free online lecture brought to you by the Virtual Law Companion of Biliasis Law Center. Prepare for the bar examinations at any time, anywhere, and from any mobile device. Just check out the VLC website at www.biliasislawcenter.com for more details and particulars. Optimize this learning opportunity. You can like, follow, and subscribe to VLC Facebook page and VLC YouTube channel. 
And please also share this live stream with your friends and together learn at the comfort of your homes. And before we start, please comment VLC if you can hear me clearly. Now, I would like to give you a brief breakdown of our lecture today. The lecture is entitled Rape Involving Minors Under the Revised Penal Code and Sexual Abuse Under the Anti-Child Abuse Law, Republic Act 7610. Now, I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation for you to understand, to better understand the subject matter. Now, why did I choose this subject? As you have learned in the 2020-2021 bar examinations, the first question in criminal law is all about rape under the revised penal code and sexual abuse under the child abuse law. So the bar examinees were asked to determine the proper crime, whether it is rape, whether it is sexual abuse under the anti-child law. So if you do not know the basic distinctions between these crimes, I'm sure you will not be able to answer the problem correctly because this was the ruling enunciated in the landmark case of People versus Tulagan, which was rendered by the Supreme Court in March of 2019. So if you do not know, again, the basic distinctions between these crimes, you will not be able to answer the question correctly. So we'll now proceed. So the outline of the lecture is, what are the crimes in focus here? Of course, rape and sexual abuse. And how did RA 8353 redefine the crime of rape. And what are the kinds of rape under the existing laws? And what is sexual abuse under Republic Act 7610 or more commonly known as the anti-child abuse law? And what, whether or not sweetheart doctrine can be applied in violation of RA 7610. And of course, the amendment introduced by Republic Act 11648 to crime of rape, especially on statutory construction. What are the issues involved in the said amendment? So I've said the crimes in focus are rape and sexual abuse. What is rape under RA 8353? The new anti-rape law was passed in 1997. It was signed by then President Fidel Ramos repealing Article 335 of the Revised Penal Code and introducing Articles 266-A, 266-B, and 266-C up to 266-D in the Revised Penal Code. The law introduced a new crime in the Philippine jurisprudence, which is rape by sexual assault. That is a new kind of rape. And the crime of rape is now under Title VIII, uh, Crimes Against Persons of the Revised Penal Code. Formerly, the crime of rape was under Title XI, Crimes Against Chastity. So what is the effect of the, the transfer from titles, Title XI to Title VIII? Basically, the intent of the Congress in transferring the crime of rape from Title 11 to Title 8 is to make the crime as public one or a public crime. It was formerly private crime under Title 11, but now with the transfer of this, with the migration of this crime from Title 11 to Title 8, it is now a public crime. So it, it can be now prosecuted the vision, meaning any person can now initiate the crime of rape 
that's the rationale with the amendment of the law. And to prevent extinguishment of criminal liability in, in rape cases through express pardon by the offended party. Okay. So what are the kinds of rape under this law? There are two kinds of rape. Rape by sexual intercourse and rape by sexual assault. As you know, rape by sexual intercourse is the traditional form of rape. It has been there since 1932 when this revised penal code was became effective. So we all know about the concept of rape by sexual intercourse. Jurisprudence would state that rape by sexual intercourse is a crime committed by a man against a woman. And the central element of this is carnal knowledge. Under Republic Act 8353, or even under the old provisions of the law, this crime can never be committed by a woman. However, in one case, a man uh, or a woman cooperating with a man in raping a victim may be held liable as principal by direct participation. So that is an exceptional case. As, as I've said, the central element is carnal knowledge. What is carnal knowledge? Carnal knowledge is an act of man having sexual bodily connections with a woman. So from this definition, you can now say that rape can only be committed by a man against a woman. So never committed by a woman against a man. And the basic element is carnal knowledge, not ejaculation, not sexual intercourse. Because carnal knowledge and sexual intercourse are not the same. Carnal knowledge is committed by, by, his, by an act of man when the tip of his erect penis touches the labia majora, majora of the female genitalia. In sexual intercourse, there must be penetration of the vagina or rupture of the hymen. So in, the, in that concept, because of that distinction, you can now say that carnal knowledge is not sexual intercourse. So how do you distinguish carnal, carnal knowledge from sexual intercourse? Carnal knowledge is an act of man having bodily connection with a woman. In sexual intercourse, the essential ingredient thereof is the penetration of the female sexual organ by the sexual organ of the male. So that's the, the distinction. So we said mere touching consummates the crime of rape. So what is the nature of touching? As defined by the Supreme Court in the case of People versus Kampuhan, Touching, when applied to rape cases, does not simply mean mere epidermal contact or stroking or grazing of organs or a slight brush or a scrape of the penis on the external layer of the victim's vagina. There must be evidence to prove that the penis touched the labia majora or is lead into it and not merely stroke the external surface thereof. So to the point of contact, is the labia, labia majora of the female genitalia. So that's, that's if there's no touching, or if the touching pertains on the other parts of the female genitalia, the crime could, could only be attempted rape, not consummated rape. Now, the female genitalia, as explained in Kampuhan case, refers to this, the pudendum or vulva, the mons pubis, the labia majora, and the labia minora. So if you read these slides, th this particular slide, you can easily determine that labia majora is different from other parts of the female genitalia. So what is being required to be touched is the lab labia majora, not on other parts of the female genitalia. And full penetration is not required to commit rape. It is sufficient that the entrance of the male organ touches the labia. 
Thus, the Supreme Court held that the act committed is consummated rape. Or if there is presence of hyperemia or the blood in tissues. Supreme Court also said that this indicates consummated rape. So the medical examination report would be helpful in determining whether the act is consummated one. And a new case, September 2021, People versus Triple X, Kinis Kiss. The testimony of the victim is to the effect that the offender's penis, Kinis Kiss in vernacular, meaning rubbing, Kinis Kiss. When there was a rubbing of the penis on the vagina, it demonstrates touching of the genitalia. In other case, January 2020, people versus Gratella, it is not necessary that the victim saw the big offender's penis because rape can be established even if the victim did not see the accused insert the penis into her vagina. As long as there is medical certificate that would corroborate that a blunt object like a penis had caused trauma on her genitalia. Now, what is rape by sexual assault? As I've said, this is a new form of rape under Republic Act 8353. Rape by sexual assault is committed in two ways. Number one, by inserting the penis of the offender to another person's mouth or anal orifice. And second, by inserting any object or instrument into the genital or anal orifice of another person. Supreme Court said that this is a gender-free or homosexual rape or object rape because anybody can commit this crime, whether he is, that the offender is a male or a female, or whether the victim is a male or a female. The gravamen of this crime is the insertion of the penis into another's mouth or anal orifice or instrument or object into another's another person's genital or anal orifice. As I've said, the offender can, may be a woman or a man, and the offended party may be a man or a woman. So what kind of object? By jurisprudence, again, Supreme Court said that an object can be in the form of cigarette stick, a tongue, a finger, or any solid object like a welding rod. And this, there is no necessity for the victim to identify what kind of object was inserted. <clears throat> it is enough that there was, or there is something that was inserted into her vagina or anal orifice. That is enough to constitute this crime. However, Justice Leonen and Justice Martires hold the view that a finger is not an object. A finger is, when it is used in the sexual attack, there is the crime of rape by sexual intercourse because the finger is part of the male's body. So that is the only the opinion of Justice Leonian, Justice Martires. That is not the majority opinion of the Supreme Court. When, when a finger is used, the crime committed is rape by sexual assault. Okay. Canalingus or oral sex performed by a man or even a woman on a woman is rape by sexual assault. It is not acts of lasciviousness because a tongue is considered as an, an object for purposes of this crime. And mere touching of the tongue on the genitalia or vagina of a woman, can it, it, it is a crime of rape by sexual assault. So how do you distinguish rape by sexual intercourse and rape by sexual assault? So this is the, these are the distinctions. Okay, so 
Sexual assault is gender free. Sexual intercourse offender is a man. Rape by sexual intercourse and rape by sexual assault are not the same. The elements of these crimes are not the same. So if the crime charge is rape by sexual intercourse and the crime proven during trial is rape by sexual assault, the accused can be convicted of rape by sexual assault because of the so-called variance doctrine. But rape by sexual intercourse and rape by sexual assault can be committed in the same sexual attack. Just like in this case, where the Supreme Court held that the father of the 15-year-old victim first inserted his finger in, in, in the vagina of the victim. Then he inserted his penis later. The accused committed two crimes, uh, which is lascivious conduct or rape by sexual assault and rape by sexual intercourse. And rape by sexual assault is not subsumed in crime and rape by sexual intercourse because of their material differences with respect to their elements. Okay. But one, may, in this 20, June 2021 20, case, as an exception, one may be convicted of rape by sexual intercourse and rape by sexual assault. So in this case, June 2021 case, the charges or the information contains both allegations for violation of rape by sexual assault and rape by sexual intercourse. So it is in violation of the rule in remedial, remedial law or criminal procedure that the information should only charge one offense. But in this case, the Supreme Court said that the accused failed to object, failed to file a motion to quash during the trial. And that constitutes waiver on his part. So the, the trial court, if the accused does not object to that, or does not file a motion to quash on the ground of that the information contains more than one offense, so this, the trial court can convict the accused of this crime, either rape by sexual assault or rape by sexual intercourse, or both. Now we go to RA 7610, Anti-Child Abuse Law. As a backgrounder, this law was passed in 1992, and that the purpose of which is to protect the most vulnerable members of the society, the youth, the Filipino children, from all forms of neglect, abuse, cruelty, exploitation, and other conditions prejudicial to their development. So that is the primordial purpose of this law. And the, the law covers only children or minors as victims. If we say minors, and we, it means to say that the age is less than or below 18 years of age. So there is a crime under Section 5 of the law, the so-called sexual abuse. And that is, this is the provision penalizing sexual abuse. Those who commit the act of sexual intercourse with a child exploited in prostitution or subject to other sexual abuse. So take note that there are two situations where this law would apply. And number one is when there is exploitation in prostitution or when a child is exploited in prostitution. And the other one is other sexual abuse. So those two situations, two circumstances are different. Okay. If the age, if the subject or the victim is a minor, then this law would apply. Then this law would take the case out of revised penal code. So what is applicable now is Republic Act 7610. But if the age of the victim is less than 12, I should warn you that this was already amended, but I am not discussing para 
to, to, to avoid any confusion later on. But the this law was already amended by Republic Act 11648, effective March 2022. Instead of 12, it is now 16. But for purposes of discussion, to avoid any confusion, we'll just stick to 12. So if when the victim is under 12 years of age, the crime is not sexual abuse, but statutory rape under Article 266-A of the Revised Penal Code, as amended by RA 8353. So the so-called doctrine or principle of absorption applies now. The Revised Penal Code absorbs the crime of sexual abuse and it becomes a statutory rate if the age of the victim is less than 12 years of age. So that is clear. So what are the elements of sexual abuse? First, the act of sexual intercourse. And the act is performed with a child exploited and in prostitution or other sexual abuse. And the victim, whether male or female, is below 18 years of age. So the first element merely tells us that the accused commits the act of sexual intercourse with the child. And the second element is the most important one because it will determine whether this law would apply or not. So 7610 would apply, not a revised penal code, if the child is deemed exploited in prostitution. When do you say that the child is exploited in prostitution? When there is money, profit, or any other consideration involved. Just like when you promise, when you give the victim money so that she would agree to sexual intercourse, profit or any other considerations, like when you promise to give her or him cellular phone that would, so that he would, he or she would agree to the sexual intercourse. And other sexual abuse, here there is no money, there's no profit or any other consideration involved. But the Supreme Court in the case of Queen Bell versus People said there must be coercion or influence on the part of the offender so that the, the offender would have sexual intercourse with the victim. So the most common situation is other sexual abuse. So Republic Act 7610 is applicable if the offender is an adult. So any adult. If the victim is or the offender is not an adult, just like whether, when he is also a minor, then this law does not apply. But Republic uh, Revised Penal Code is the one applicable. Okay. So, what is the meaning of the phrase other sexual abuse? When the, the sexual intercourse is committed, under the coercion or influence of any adult. It exists when there is some form of compulsion that would equate to intimidation and that would subdue the free exercise of the victim's free will. You know, that's the definition of other sexual abuse. It involves the use of employment, use, persuasion, inducement, enticement, or coercion of a child to engage in or assist another to engage in sexual intercourse. So that's the situation of other sexual abuse. So coercion and influence, as explained by the Supreme Court in Queen Bell versus People, coercion is the improper use of power to compel another to submit to the wishes of one who wields it. The term influence, improper use of power. So that is the, those are the definitions provided by the Supreme Court so that we can understand the concept of coercion in influence. And the co concept of coercion in influence is broader than force and intimidation. 
So force and intimidation is just a species of coercion and influence. You will find the phrase force and intimidation in the crime of rape. But in the crime of sexual abuse, or yes, the term not used is not force or intimidation, but coercion and influence. So if you use coercion and influence, that is the manner of commission, the proper crime is sexual abuse under Republic Act 7610. But if the manner of committing the act is by force or intimidation, then the law applicable is revised penal code. So that is the explanation. Now, we, we, we cannot understand coercion <coughs> or influence unless we read the Supreme Court decisions on this matter. Because it is only when the Supreme Court provides for a clearer definition or explanation of the concept that we can understand it. So in you lull your case, there is coercion when there is threat made by the offender, by the offender. When there was sexual abuse, when the accused had sexual intercourse with the victim who was only 11 years old by threatening her that he would kidnap her sibling. Tinakot. Oh, kukunin ko yung kapatid mo kung hindi ka nakipag-sex sa akin. And moral ascendancy amounts to coercion. Okay? The case of Queen Bell. When yung bata requested Queen Bell to stay with them during the night because the parents of the minors were out of the house. And the victim requested Queen Bell just to stay to be with them during the night. But Queen Bell made some lascivious act. And according to the Supreme Court, moral ascendancy amounts to coercion. In People versus Udin, November 2020, compulsion may amount to coercion. Okay? When the victim or when the offender blocked the victim in a place where there were no houses at all, and he pulled her to a forested area where he made the lascivious acts with her. That is coercion. And in Caballo case, 2017, the promise of marriage and the assurance of the, vic of the offender that, she, she, that the victim would not get, get pregnant that, it, that would constitute influence. The, the victim was assured by her boyfriend that she would not get pregnant because she would be using withdrawal method that would constitute influence. In Chabi's case, when the offender and the victim watch porno or X-rated film before the act, the act of the big vendor in, allow, in allowing the victim to watch X -rated, an X-rated film that would amount to inducement or enticement. And moral and psychological coercion of the teacher or instructor that is influence also. In Orso's case, in the swimming instructor or the trainer of the 14-year-old girl committed the serious conduct upon her. And the Supreme Court said because of the relationship built, being the trainer or swimming instructor, there was influence on, he exerted influence upon the victim. And the Malto case in 2007, the college professor who courted his uh, female student, that is coercion or influence. And in the Lacrosse case in June 2021, a school teacher courted his 13-year-old student and he touched her leg and required another minor to kiss other, you know, his, her classmate. And that is, that is 
there is more coercion or influence in this in that case. And the case of Garingarao, Garingarao was a nurse, and uh, on on the pretext of conducting a procedure in the, in the hospital where the victim was confined, he touched the breast of the victim and inserted his finger into her private part. There is influence there because as a patient, he's, he, he, she was under the influence of the nurse, male nurse. And people versus Carbonell. Carbonell discovered that the victim, 15-year-old victim, was using a contraceptive. contraceptive. So he threatened her, oh, you are using a contraceptive. I will tell your mother about this. <laughs> but I will not tell your mother if you allow me to do this. So that's it. It is as if there was blackmailing. And the girl consented, agreed. So there was coercion or an influence. And the PMA or CAT commandant, high school. Uh, if he, he asked his student if he, she wanted to be a, an officer of the CAT. So the commandant exercises influence over her. And when the victim is a domestic servant, the Makuta case, the employer may exercise influence over her. So there is therefore a violation of this law. And in the La Cruz 20, 21, the age difference, of, if the, the age gap between the offender and the victim, assuming the victim was only 17 or 14, and the uh, offender is 25, so there is a vast difference be between their ages. And that would constitute coercion and intimidation. So the third element, the victim must be a minor, meaning his or her age is below 18. So if the victim is below 18, you will now apply not only the revised penal code, but 7610. Okay, that's the rule. That's, that's the rule. Whenever you encounter a problem that the victim is below 18, do not think merely of the revised penal code. Because there is a special penal law, the Public Act 7610, that would apply. So uh, I'm not saying that if the victim is Below 18, the only law is RA 7610. That is not my point. My point is there are two laws that you will consider, the Revised Penal Code and RA 7610. That is the, 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 the our objective in this lecture, how to determine whether it is Revised Penal Code or RA 7610. And because the age of the victim determines the proper crime okay so uh, if if the age of the victim is below 18 then you have either revised penal code or ra 7610 that but under if it is 7610 there's still another rule to be observed that if the victim is less than 12 years of age The applicable law is revised in that code. So Mahira, this is a, a, a complicated law that would allow the application of the revised penal code if the age of the minor is below 12 years of age. Because in those in that instance, the crime is statutory rape. Now we'll now go to the the distinction between sex coercion and intimidation under the revised penal code. So that's the distinction between these two concepts, coercion and influence on one hand, force and intimidation on the other hand. 
distinction. Now, the best evidence to prove the age of the victim is the birth certificate. In the absence of the birth certificate, any other similar authentic documents, such as baptismal certificate or school records. Or in the absence of those, the testimony of the mother, the testimony of any member of the family, or even the teacher. Now we go to the gist or the main objective of this lecture. Is it rape or sexual abuse? These are the rules that we observe. How would, you, how would you determine if the crime is rape under the revised penal code or sexual abuse under RA 7610? Now there are issues to be considered. Number one, age of the victim. Because according to the Supreme Court and people versus Tulagan, the proper crime would differ depending on the age of the victim. And the second, whether or not double jeopardy can be applied. Can you be charged both a rape and at the same time sexual abuse? The importance of this is highlighted, was highlighted in the bar exam in February of this year in criminal law. The first bar exam in criminal law, but the first question is this. So if you have noticed, if you have followed the bar exam last February, this, is, this was the first question in criminal law. So the problem states, a former beauty queen was only 16 years old when she had her first sexual intercourse with her ex-boyfriend who was 28 years old. And in her narration, she said that she did not know that she was, what she was doing and noted that her ex-BF was a more advanced age. Okay? That she repeatedly said no to her boyfriend, but the boyfriend was too strong for her. And the boyfriend left her afterwards. Was there a crime committed by the ex-boyfriend? Oh, yeah. That's the sim simple question. But simple as it may appear, but it requires depth of your knowledge in criminal laws, particularly rape and sexual abuse. So we will not proceed. Is it rape or sexual abuse? You cannot say it is rape or sexual abuse without knowing these cases. The first is a by case 209. The offender, the offended party was 13 years old. The information contained all the elements of rape and sexual abuse. The, the prosecution was able to prove that there was force and intimidation because the accused threatened the victim with a bladed instrument. That's why the Supreme Court said that it was rape because the prosecution did not tackle coercion or influence as a mode of committing the crime. So it was rape. This was followed by Pangilinan case in 2011. The Supreme Court was faced with the same dilemma because all the elements of rape and all the elements of sexual abuse were present. But here, this, the Supreme Court reiterated Abai because the prosecution, the prosecution's evidence tackled on force or intimidation because the victim here was threatened with a samurai, samurai sword by the offender. So the rape was the proper crime. And in 2017, People versus Tobilio, the Supreme Court formally instituted this focus of evidence approach following Abai and Pangilinan doctrine. So it, it must be the, the, the prosecution, the trial court should determine the proper crime by basing its decision on the evidence adduced by the prosecution, whether it is by force or intimidation or coercion or influence. But in 2018, Supreme Court abandoned the focus of evidence ruling. In People versus Ejerceto, the Supreme Court 
preferred rape as the proper crime. If the evidence or the elements of crime of rape and elements of sexual abuse are both present, then this focus of evidence should be disregarded, but what is applicable is the provisions of the revised penal code on rape. Because according to the Supreme Court, Republic Act 8353 is more recent than Republic Act 7610. Okay, so that's it. So in these cases, the, the Supreme Court noted that the information alleges this one, carnal knowledge or sexual intercourse was due to force or intimidation and due to coercion or influence. What is the proper crime? In another scenario, another case, the information wrongfully designates the crime in the, as violation of Article 266, Paragraph 1A in relation to Section 5B, RA 91 or 7610. So which is the proper crime? If you are the trial court judge, how would you convict the accused? Is it for rape or sexual abuse? Now the rules, the accused, according to the Supreme Court, should be prosecuted for rape. Because the RA 8353 is more recent and it is special penal legislation that is not only consistent, but also strengthens the policies of Republic Act 716. Okay, so that's the ruling. It must be read. And to continue, according to the Supreme Court, Republic Act 8353 upholds the policies and principles of Republic Act 716, and it provides a stronger deterrence and special protection against child abuse. So that's it. But this has been clarified in people versus Tolagan case. We are not saying that it is all, always rape. Sabi na Supreme Court. What about RA 7610? Are we saying that RA 7610 is now an obsolete law. Because according to the People vs. Ejercito, Republic Act 8353 is the applicable law being more recent. So this is not the intention of the Supreme Court. In the case of Tulagan, it was clarified that if the sexual intercourse is committed with an offended party who is less than 12 years, now 16 years, the crime is statutory rape, meaning the revised penal code is applicable. But when the offended party is more than eight, more than 12, less than 18, and the charge against the accused is that there was carnal knowledge committed through force, threat, or intimidation, then he will be prosecuted for it. On the other hand, if there is sexual intercourse with a minor, whose age is more than 12, less than, or below 18, and the allegation of the mode of committing the crime is the child is being exploited in prostitution or other sexual abuse, then the proper crime is sexual abuse under 7610. So these are the distinctions. Below 12, always rape, statutory rape. If above 12, less than 18, the crime is rape if the mode of committing the act is by force, threat, or intimidation. And if the mode of commission is, there is, the child is being expo exploited in prostitution or subjected her to other sexual abuse, then the proper crime is sexual abuse under the Public Act 7610. And double jeopardy applies. Now, the old doctrine, there is no violation of double jeopardy, meaning the accused can be charged both with rape and violation of RA 7610. Now, in a 2020 case, no. If the, the, the double jeopardy doctrine 
now applies. Okay, so there can be no multiple or two charges of crimes against the accused. And there's no complex crime of rape with sexual abuse. You only have to determine whether it is rape or whether it is sexual abuse. Just uh, based on my explanation earlier. So these are the distinctions. Okay, so that is just a summary of our discussion earlier. And as held in People versus Triple X, September 2020, the distinctions between rape and sexual abuse. Take note, the distinction lies merely on the second element, the mode of committing it, committing the crime. If it is through threat or intimidation, then it is rape. If it is through exploitation and prostitution or other sexual abuse, then it is the crime is sexual abuse under RA 7610. So that's clear now. Is sweetheart defense available in Republic Act 7610? If your answer is based on Malto, people versus Malto in 2007, you will answer yes. And I'm sorry, no. Because according to the Supreme Court and Malto doctrine, a minor cannot give his or her valid consent under the civil law. And this was reiterated in Olayon 2008, that the minor cannot give his or her consent. Also in Caballo case 2013. In 2013, the Supreme Court said that consent is immaterial because this is a crime of malum prohibitum. The, doc, the ruling was, was uh, changed in the case of People versus Tulagan 2019. In People versus Tulagan, the Supreme Court gave this obiter dictum that when only in, if in instances where the victim is below 12, that you cannot entertain sweetheart doctrine. If the age of the victim is more than 12, less than 18, then you have to examine the evidence if there is indeed consent in the sexual intercourse. So in this officer dictum of people versus Tulagan, the Supreme Court said sweetheart doctrine is now applicable in 7016 cases. But that, that is only an officer dictum, meaning that is not binding on other cases. That is only a, an opinion of the court, oh. Supreme Court. But in 2019, this obiter dictum became a starry disease, meaning it, it can now be invoked. Because in the case of People versus Monroy, the Supreme Court said categorically that sweetheart defense can now be entertained. In this case of Monroy, a 14-year-old victim used to live with her sister and together with Monroy. One night, the Monroy was drunk. He borrowed the blanket of the victim. When the victim retrieved the blanket, Monroy pinned her onto the bed and inserted his penis into her vagina. Now, she was prosecuted for a crime, but and the, the trial court convicted Monroy. On appeal, the Supreme Court reverse the conviction applying the sweetheart defense. The Supreme Court noted that there was a love letter produced by Monroy showing that indeed the victim and the Monroy were lovers. Because according to the victim in that letter, she would commit suicide if the offender of Monroy would leave her. So that is an indication that they were indeed lovers. And the same ruling was reiterated in Bangayan case, September 2020. The victim in Bangayan case was only 12 years and one month old. And Bangayan was 27 years of age. There is a 15 years age gap. Now they were caught by the brother of the victim having sexual intercourse on a table. Then Bangayan was charged with violation of Republic Act 7610. 
He was convicted by the trial court. But on appeal, the court reversed the conviction, saying that when the age of the minor is more than 12, you have to, the evidence must be strictly scrutinized in order to determine the presence of sexual consent. If there is sexual consent, there is no crime committed by the offender, unless the child is exploited, is deemed exploited in child prostitution or subjected to other sexual abuse. But if there's no such showing, there's no crime, according to the Supreme Court. Now we now, will now come to the last part of the lecture, the amendment introduced by Republic Act 11648. On March 4, 2022, President Duterte signed this law. It amended the provision of artist, Article 266-A, specifically on statutory construct, statutory rate, I'm sorry. Now, the old provision, um, first, the old provision and you, um, defines rape as a crime committed by a man who shall have carnal knowledge of a woman. And now, the new provision states that rape is now committed by a person who shall have carnal knowledge of another person. So the woman was, the word woman was changed to person to make it gender free. So any person can, can, can refer to a male or a female. And the victim, another person, can also refer, refer to a male or a female. So that's the first amendment. The second amendment is with respect to statutory rape. That eh, under the old provision, the rape, Statutory rape is committed by when the, the victim is less than 12. Now, the victim is, should be under 16 years of age. So tinas, the age threshold was increased from 12 to 16. But there is an exception to the rule. If the age of the victim is less than 16, there is no statutory rape if first, if the age difference between the offender and the offended party is not more than three years. And that the sexual act is consensual, it is non-abusive, it is non-exploitative. So there is no statutory rate there. But if the victim, exception to the exception, if the victim is less than 13 years of age, there is the, the, the exception does not apply. It is always rape, statutory rape. So in effect, what the law, what the amendment was, uh, what the amendment introduced is there is no rape, uh, there is statutory rape if the age of the victim is less than 13. That is less than 12. So in effect, isa lang ang tinaas from 12 to 13. Because in more than 13, less than 16 category, you should identify if there is consent to the sexual act. And whether there is consent and the age difference is not more than three years. So, so with the amendment, we are confronted now whether the offender can, will refer to a man or a woman because the law now uses the word person meaning gender free. And what about the concept of carnal knowledge? Because jurisprudence defines carnal knowledge as an, a man having sexual bodily connection with a man. Now, under the new amendment, under the new law, if, is it, does it necessarily follow that there is sex carnal knowledge if the offender is a woman? So, because it becomes gender free. So that's a problem. So there's no jurisprudence yet on this matter, okay? And as I've said, the statute, in the statutory rate, uh, you can determine if there is consent between the ages of 13 and 16. If there is consent, there is the age 
gap between the offender is not more than three, and there is no, it is non-abusive, non-exploitative, then there is no crime of the statutory rate. So the exception to the exception, if the victim is under 13 of years of age, in which case the rule is absolute. There is always statutory rate. So when is it non-abusive? The law defines it as the absence of undue influence, intimidation, fraudulent machination, coercion, threat, physical, sexual, psychological, or mental injury or maltreatment. There is non-exploitative when there is no actual or attempted act of unfairly taking advantage of the child's position of vulnerability, differential power, or trust during the conduct of the sexual activities. So this is now complicated because 7610 also uses coercion and influence. But with the amendment, it Coercion or influence is also taken into consideration if the age is between 13 and less than 16. To determine whether there is a statutory rate. But for purposes of applic applying Art Republic of 7610, it is only applicable now if the victim is less than, uh, more, than 15, more than 16, and less than 18. In effect, if the victim is only 16, 17, that's the time you apply 76 10. So in is applicable if the age is 15, 14, 13, or even 12. So Tinaasna, because of the increase of the coverage of Republic of uh, Revised Penal Code, Dinesha Saklaw, in other words, by Republic of 7610. That's the effect of this amendment. And this amendment, uh, this law also amended 7610. Yung ating dini discuss kanina, section 5b. That in, in lieu of 12 years of age, so 16 na siya. So from more than 16, less than 18, you would apply section 5b. And is statutory rate less than 16? The crime instead of sexual abuse, if the age of the victim is less than 16, then the crime is no longer sexual abuse, but statutory rape. Right? That's the effect of the amendment. So in, you, you will also apply the exception if there is consent, sexual consent, the age gap non-exploitative, non-abusive, sa age bracket na 13 to 16, less than 16. So the same rule applied. But the, this, uh, the provision of RA 7610, Section 5B, has been, al has been amended al also by Republic Act 11648. So I think that is the, that's the, uh, um, the latest update on this law. I hope with my lecture on, on this topic, you will be able to answer the bar question if there, is, there will be any in the 2022 bar exam in November of this year. I hope and I will, I hope that this question, a question from this field will be asked by the three examiners of in criminal law. So I hope with my lecture, I was able to share with you some concepts in criminal law, particularly rape and sexual abuse. Thank you for your time, for your interest in watching this lecture. Thank you. Bye bye.
We are VLC. We offer value, providing you with quality review programs and online seminars that bring out the best in you. At VLC, we listen. Adapting to the times, we brought our in-demand on-ground review lectures online with our virtual law companion. Subscribing to this online learning platform means you get 24-7 access to our updated video lectures and bar review notes from the best and most respected lecturers and professors. At VLC, we collaborate, working with the best technology providers through our learning management system to best prepare you for the first ever digitalized bar exams. We work hand-in-hand -hand with legal experts you can trust, providing top-notch services to those who need it the most through our free online legal consultations and free lecture series. Value, listen, and collaborate. This is the VLC way. And we are VLC.
Only and just me, Yeshua says, Warren to Warren to Christ. Nobody else. That is very important. And before it just me, it should search for a door, one of the breasts. What are the requirements? First, there may be trouble cause. Number two, to be determined personally by the judge. Number three, after examination under oath of the complainant and the witnesses may produce. Number four, particularly describing the search, place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized or arrested. Those are the requisites before a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest. But first of all, take note, only a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest, nobody else. That's why uh, it's still pending in the Supreme Court now, diba? Right? Article 3, paragraph 3 of the family code, we have the provision for a marriage ceremony. Now, in our jurisdiction, we do not recognize ang ceremonial marriages. There must be a marriage ceremony. The minimum requirement is that the contracting parties must personally appear before the solemnizing officer and personally declare that they take each other as husband and wife in the presence of at least two witnesses of legal age. Now, even assuming that there was no uh, witness here, the marriage will also remain valid. That will be considered a mere irregularity that will not affect the validity of the marriage. Now, under Article 26, Paragraph 1 of the Family Code, all marriages solidified. within the contemplation of Article 4 of the Revised Penal Code. As a general rule, threat to spouse, that is threat, that is a felony. Tinakot mo sasaktan eh, papaluin eh. Pero in this case, the threat to spouse is a justified threat to spouse due to the circumstance of no, de uh, defense of property. And second, the threat to spank was made in the exercise of a right under the self-help doctrine, Article 429 of the Revised Penal Code. Owner, owner or lawful possessor of a thing has the right to exclude others from the enjoyment or disposal thereof. And for this purpose, they may use force which is reasonably necessary to pre prevent or repel an act. Issuance of a warrant of arrest is to follow blindly the finding of probable cause by the prosecutor, precisely because the prosecutor determines probable cause for the filing of the information in court, whereas the judge determines probable cause for the issuance of a warrant of arrest. So, okay, well. Pero sa issuance ng search warrant, as mentioned, it should be proving. In other words, my friends, the judge must personally conduct an examination of the complainant and the witnesses um, that he may produce under oath or affirmation. The examination by the judge must be proven. Okay? It is not enough to merely adopt the questions and answers asked by the, by a, by the previous uh, investigator, during the PI. Magkaiba yun. Bakit? Kailangan po, the judge should personally examine the complainant and the witnesses. So this are the...
are VLC. We offer value, providing you with quality review programs and online seminars that bring out the best in you. At VLC, we listen. Adapting to the times, we brought our in-demand on-ground review lectures online with our virtual law companion. Subscribing to this online learning platform means you get 24-7 access to our updated video lectures and bar review notes from the best and most respected lecturers and professors. At VLC, we collaborate, working with the best technology providers through our learning management system to best prepare you for the first ever digitalized bar exams. We work hand-in-hand -hand with legal experts you can trust, providing top-notch services to those who need it the most through our free online legal consultations and free lecture series. Value, listen, and collaborate. This is the VLC way. And we are VLC.
Only a just me, a search warrant or warrant of us, nobody else. That is very important. And before a just me, a search warrant or warrant of us, what are the requirements? First, there may be trouble cause. Number two, to be determined personally by the judge. Number three, after examination under oath of the complainant and the witnesses may produce. Number four particularly describing the search, place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized or arrested. Those are the requisites before a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest. But first of all, take note, only a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest, nobody else. That's why uh, it's still pending at the Supreme Court now, right? Article 3, paragraph 3 of the family code, we have the provision for a marriage ceremony. Now, in our jurisdiction, we do not recognize unceremonial marriages. There must be a marriage ceremony. The minimum requirement is that the contracting parties must personally appear before the solemnizing officer and personally declare that they take each other as husband and wife in the presence of at least two witnesses of legal age. Now, even assuming that there was no uh, witness here, the marriage will also remain valid. That will be considered a mere irregularity that will not affect the validity of the marriage. Now, under Article 26, Paragraph 1 of the Family Code, all marriages solidized. Felony within the contemplation of Article 4 of the Revised Penal Code as a general rule, threat to spouse, that is threat, that is a felony. Tinakot mo sasaktan eh, papaluin eh. Pero in this case, the threat to spouse is a justified threat to spouse due to the circumstance of no, de uh, defense of property. And second, the threat to spank was made in the exercise of a right under the self-help doctrine, Article 429 of the Revised Penal Code. Owner, owner or lawful possessor of a thing has the right to exclude others from the enjoyment or disposal thereof. And for this purpose, he may use force which is reasonably necessary to pre prevent or repel an act. is a 
not allowed to is not allowed to do it. You talk about issuance of award of arrest is to follow blindly the finding of probable cause with the prosecutor, precisely because the prosecutor determines probable cause for the filing of the information in court, whereas the judge determines probable cause for the issuance of award of arrest. So, okay, okay. Pero sa issuance ng search warrant as mentioned, it should be proving. In other words, my friends, the judge must personally conduct an examination of the complainant and the witnesses um, that he may produce under oath or affirmation. The examination by the judge must be proving. Okay? It is not enough to merely adopt the questions and answers asked by the, by the, by the previous uh, investigator during the PI. Magkaiba yun. Bakit? Kailangan po the judge should personally examine the complainant and the witnesses. So it's hard to